This program is brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U at Stanford University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu. I'm going to take you through some of the definitions and background and the uh, extent of the problem with heart failure and then just outline for you some of the advances that have been taking place in the last 25 years that's really offered an extraordinary, successful, well-proven um, variety of therapies for this common condition. My colleague Ewan Ashley is then going to look into the future always a more difficult task and he's going to go through I think where we're going to be going with some of the research that we're doing here at Stanford and around the world to, uh, to further improve the outcomes uh, for specific individual patients, a more specific individualized approach perhaps in the future for patients with common condition. Now heart failure is a, a syndrome, it's a constellation of a series of uh, symptoms and signs which you recognize. It's been de defined and this is one of the definitions for heart failure that's taken out of the uh, guidelines for the management of heart failure for the American Heart Association and defines heart failure as a complex clinical syndrome that can result from any structural or functional cardiac disorder that impairs the ability of the ventricle, the pumping chamber of the heart, to fill or eject blood. Now you probably think you are, but perhaps some of you felt that you were coming to a lecture on congestive heart failure and this indeed was the old term, if you like, for heart failure, we often refer to as CHF or congestive heart failure, but many patients recognize that with appropriate management, appropriate dietary restriction, that they were not congested most of the time. And so there's been a push to change the term and remove the word congestive from this syndrome um, of heart failure, which goes through phases perhaps when the patient may or may not be congested. This slide outlines some of the epidemiology of heart failure and just tells us just how common this disease is. In fact, at the, at the moment in the United States, as you can see, um, there's about five million patients who have heart failure and largely because of the demographics of our patient population, heart failure being a disease of the elderly, but perhaps also because more patients are surviving the earlier precursor conditions there is actually going to be a significant increase in the population of patients with heart failure. So the estimates are by 2037, we're going to have more than 10 million patients in the United States with this serious condition that uses a lot of healthcare resources and also is a very serious condition in terms of morbidity and uh, mortality for the patients that have it. The incidence is about 500 and 50,000 new cases each year and the prevalence is about 2% in patients aged 40 to 59 but as I said a disease of the elderly so that by the time we get to 70 years and older we um, would expect 10% um, of patients to have heart failure. Sudden cardiac death, a risk for all patients is especially common in patients with heart failure and is six to nine times higher in the heart failure patient population than a non-heart failure patient population. In fact, rather ominously, the actuarial lifetime risk for a man or a woman who reaches the age of 40 is a one in five chance, a one in 20 chance, a 20% chance, one in five of developing heart failure. This next slide is a bit depressing as well because it shows this disease of the elderly carries a poor prognosis Women perhaps have a slightly better prognosis than men and tend to develop heart failure at older age, are more likely to have impaired relaxation, impaired filling of their pumping chambers as opposed to, opposed to impaired um, contraction. But as you can see, the prognosis in both men and women is poor with less than 50% of the patients alive at the end of um, five years and with severe symptoms 
the five-year mortality is even higher and um, actually approaches um, as much as 50% at one year in the high-risk patients with this, high, high symptomatic patients with this disease. Another huge problem with heart failure is the heart failure patients at risk of recurrent hospitalizations. And you can here you see the number of heart failure hospitalizations in the United States. And rather amazingly to some people, you'll actually see of the one million hospitalizations for heart failure, in fact slightly more, over 500,000 of these occur in women with just under that number in men. So a very common problem. This slide I think is an important slide. It summarizes a lot of data and really talks about this concept of a cardiovascular continuum from cardiovascular risk, which I think has been covered to some extent in most of the cardiovascular lecture series that you've heard at Stanford, and talks about the patients who perhaps carry risks to them from dyslipidemia, particularly important for the development of heart failure, is hypertension. Hypertension with an actuarial lifetime risk of 90%. So many people are going to get hypertension. Patients who develop hypertension then thicken up their ventricles and develop left ventricular hypertrophy are particularly likely to get heart failure. And if you have diabetes, or the precursor condition to diabetes, insulin resistance, it's that patient population that particularly is likely to get heart failure and to develop heart failure with diabetes at a younger age. So this is one continuum, and the continuum that perhaps occurs to most patients, where the injury that leads the vicious cycle and the changes in the heart structure and function, loss of contraction, is often the injury in events that surround the acute myocardial infarction, the coronary thrombosis, that causes the secondary loss of muscle and the damage to the heart. I think we recognize more and more, though, from epidemiological studies, that not everybody who has heart failure has had a myocardial infarction, and a significant proportion of patients develop a so-called cardiomyopathy. And although there are different types of cardiomyopathy, the most common one to cause heart failure is an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, meaning that we don't know exactly what causes it. Viruses are often blamed, but if we look back at the epidemiology, we find these patients characteristic with the hypertensive, diabetic patients, again with the features very often of insulin resistance. And so the same pathway seems to take place as to whether you go to your heart failure, and the development of heart failure, loss of muscle, following a myocardial infarction, or if it's related to the same risk factors, injuring on a chronic basis the hypertension, the diabetes, the abnormal metabolism. And this is where a lot of work is taking place. The concept that the best way to treat heart failure is to prevent it has been incorporated into the last two um, guidelines. And I put here on the continuum slide this concept of stage A, being patients at risk of developing heart failure, a stage that has been defined and characterized in the guidelines, chaired by Sharon Hunt at Stanford. The stage B patient has a damaged heart, perhaps due to myocardial infarction and to other injuries that may have occurred, but has not yet developed and had the syndrome of heart failure, breathlessness, fluid retention, fatigue. That's a presentation with fluid in their lungs. So the stage C patient is a patient with overt heart failure, and the stage D patients is where we spend a lot of time at Stanford, where the heart failure started to become refractory to the conventional therapies that I'm going to go through briefly that can be so effective. Now this slide is only for the 18-year-olds with a very uh, um, highly um, developed vision, but it just puts out from the document from the American Heart Association, um, the guidelines document, it talks about the stage A and stage B patients that I've characterized for you as being at high risk for heart failure, the stage B pa C patient being a classical heart failure, and the stage D patient being this end stage patient. In this slide, the committee who put together these guidelines decided the arrows could only go forwards. So although there are some very effective therapies, I'm going to show some of them to you, where in fact the heart failure syndrome seems to reverse itself, ventricular function will often improve with the therapies we now have available to us. From a conceptual point of view, once you've developed symptomatic congestive heart failure, stage C, you're always characterized and considered to be a patient that has heart failure. More difficult is this stage D patient defined in these guidelines as the patient who is no longer responding to the therapies which we developed for the last 25 years and have been, which have been so effective. So a summary would suggest that there's an injury that takes place. 
An injury might take place over many years and the injury might be the combination of insulin resistance or avert diabetes combined with its bedfellow, hypertension, the development of a left ventricular hypertrophy, the abnormal myocardial metabolism perhaps in this environment, genetic and environmental factors conspiring to cause the heart to change and remodel. But we know that incredibly important intermediary factors as is activation of the so-called neurohormonal system. These are the systems that are basically designed to maintain homeostasis, the systems are designed to maintain usual vascular tone, to regulate salt and water um, in this environment that we find ourselves in. They're the systems, the simulate nervous system is on this slide, designed for brief bursts of activity, for fight and flight. And yet we know, and much of this work was done at Stanford, that we take out a heart from somebody who's had end-stage heart failure, that there's been chronic activation of the simulate nervous system, and this continuous exposure of the heart to high levels of adrenaline and catecholamines has contributed to this vicious cycle of remodeling. And so the neurohormonal system becomes tied up in the heart failure state and is responsible for heart failure, if you like, begetting heart failure or worsening heart failure. And this understanding of the role of the sympathetic nervous system, the renin angiotensin neurosterone system, arginine invasive pressin is where I think we're going to see drugs in the future, drugs that mimic the natriuretic peptides who have the, some of the opposite balancing effects. These, these lead to dysregulation of salt and water, retention of salt and water, constriction of the arteries so the heart has to work harder, but most importantly, a progressive change in the structure and function of the heart that tends to dilate under the common forms of heart failure, get thicker, and lose its ability to contract normal. This slide is a rather more complicated version of the two principal adverse systems involved, excess continuous activation of the adrenergic nervous system, simplistic in attempt by the body teleologically to main contract, maintain contractility by increasing the force and rate of the contraction, attempts by the renin angiotensin order system, if you like, to prime the pump and maintain blood pressure with these other important hormones contributing to an excess resistance to the failing heart vasoconstriction. But instead of, failing the, instead of supporting the failing heart, these systems seem to conspire when chronically activated to contribute to the myocardial damage, the hypertrophy, the reduced contractility. And this process of changes in the myocardium, largely driven by the neurohormonal system, we refer to as remodeling. So these are the principal targets. Angiotensin II, the end, the, the, the effector, um, hormone, if you like, of the renin angiotensin orderosterone system. Orderosterone related to angiotensin II, but separately um, secreted from the uh, adrenal glands, and norepinephrine locally um, secreted at the end of the sympathetic nervous system, and also released by, of course, the uh, adrenal glands. So these are the targets that we've had drugs available to us to modulate for some time. And so perhaps the reason they chose an Englishman or Scotsman to give this lecture is that when I came to Stanford in 1982, we had two drugs to treat heart failure. One, the digoxin developed in England by Wittering, who noticed the foxglove tea being given to the patients with the dropsy, this fluid retention, and a drug that is now over 200 years old. And finally, we know that its impact on survival is exactly neutral. With as many patients developing an increased risk of arrhythmic sudden death who were given digoxin, as the number of patients who have less death due to pro less progressive heart failure. So digoxin, perhaps useful to keep you out of hospital, certainly useful if you've got a defibrillator and used in advanced heart failure, but a drug that's 200 years old, derived from the Fox Club, and, and uh, a drug that actually does have some impact to augment contractility, but which we now recognize, perhaps more importantly in low dosages, is actually also modulating and reducing the chronic sympathetic outflow um, to the failing heart. Diuretics, I think, have been the most important breakthrough therapy in terms of symptoms. Diuretics might be part of the reason why we've taken the congestion out of congestive heart failure, because patients with appropriate diets and sodium restriction and appropriate dose of diuretics can often be treated effectively as the symptoms of heart failure with diuretics. But when I came here in 1982, these were the only two drugs. We had other drugs we were experimenting with, and these drugs are not used widely now because, on the whole, those drugs turned out to be harmful including drugs that were designed to prevent the risk of arrhythmias, 
And what we did have, and it's perhaps appropriate that we mention him today, because it's almost exactly one year after he died, Norman Shumway was offering patients with this disease that inevitably in those days used to progress, cardiac transplantation. And this is a news conference, somewhere at Stanford. I don't think this building was built, but I might be wrong. I don't think it was on January 6, 1968, uh, when the first U.S. transplant was being described to the press. I think Tom Brokaw is there somewhere in that audience, and it was the first of 60,000 patients who have been offered hope and rehabilitation for what at the time was one of the few effective therapies. But in the, last, the next few minutes, because I don't want to take up all the time, I'm going to try and briefly describe to you the extraordinary progress that has taken place in drugs that largely modulate these neurohormonal systems, improve survival, reverse this remodeling process, and, improves, and um, decrease the risk of hospitalization. And then nowadays, for many patients who don't respond fully to these drugs, we have so-called devices, special type of pacemakers, special kind of pacemakers that are defibrillators, also tested in very well-conducted randomized trials. I might say that there is a huge partnership with the pharmaceutical industry in this 25-year period where the drugs were often conceptualized within academic medical centers, the role of the sympathetic nervous system being evaluated at Stanford in the hearts that came out at the time of cardiac transplantation. This system explored, and then the pharmaceutical companies often sponsoring and supporting the trials that have led to drugs that have fundamentally changed the natural history of the disease. This is a complex slide, but it shows this renin angiotensin neuroserum system. And we do have drugs, or we're developing drugs that are antagonists of this hormone renin, which is released by the juxtaglomerular apparatus of the kidney when renal perfusion is decreased, angiotensinogen available in excess in the liver, cleaved by renin to angiotensin 1, and a drug that many of you heard of, the ACE inhibitor works on the angiotensin converting enzyme, inhibiting the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Not completely blocking it, but inhibiting it. And then we have another way of modulating this system. And that is a drug class called the angiotensin receptor blockers, or ARBs, that work on the angiotensin 2 receptor, and again modulate the activity of this system that seems to exist in nature to deal with volume regulation, perhaps even wound healing. Um, but has no useful role in chronic congestive heart failure where the activation is exuberant or excessive. Downstream from angiotensin II and partly modulated by angiotensin II is another very important hormone called aldosterone, regulating sodium and potassium balance in the kidney and itself now a target for therapy with both new and old drugs. And you can see the influence shown on this slide of sodium retention and getting rid of fluid and potential, potential fluid retention of these interruptions, these pathways, but also the important effects on remodeling, which parts aren't emphasized on this slide. I was at Stanford when this study came out. Those with you sharp eyes will see it was in 1987. And this was the first time that we showed that we could give drugs to patients with advanced heart failure and have a dramatic impact on their survival. So at six months, these advanced heart failure patients, you notice that half of them on placebo had died at six months. These were the sort of patients we had seen at Stanford being considered for heart transplantation. They were on digoxin and diuretics because there were other drugs. And uh, Merck sponsored studies with anadapril. This one was done in Scandinavia. There's a place here called Northern Scandinavia, so we could say consensus, but of course we don't really know that if there is a Northern Scan Scandinavia useful for the trial purposes. And in the consensus trial, 40% survival benefit, 40% less mortality at six months, 31 less mortality at the end of 31 months. And the effect was so powerful in advanced heart failure that this trial only needed 125 patients in each group to show to us that we could change the natural history of heart failure by modulating this exuberant renin angiotensin order serum system by blocking the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 with the ACE inhibitor narapil. It worked quite well in less sick patients too. Less sick is a relative term. More than 10% of the patients had died at the end of one year. 50% of the patients would have died by the end of five years, but there were 16% less deaths 
if you randomize to an aeropril. And these two trials have now formed the basis for a core measure in all hospitals in the United States. If you come in with heart failure, you meet and you have no contraindication to these drugs, and you have an impaired ejection fraction, and you admitted one of those million hospitalizations for heart failure, you are supposed to leave taking one of these medications, and the physicians in hospitals are judged accordingly. There are problems, problem with hypotension, problems with renal function, but these drugs, under ideal circumstances, actually are also nephroprotective. Not everyone can take an ACE inhibitor. Some people cough with it. Some people develop angioedema. And the pharmaceutical company thought a better drug might be to actually block the receptor itself. And we know, without showing you all the trials, a variety of trials, that in round terms show us that the angiotensin II receptor blockers are about as effective as the ACE inhibitors. And this is a trial that compared one with the other director directly. We also therefore use an ACE inhibitor with an angiotensin receptor blocker, a sort of belt and suspenders concept. There's little to be gained in most patients, particularly because we now recognize that patients with heart failure need a comprehensive blockade or modulation of this neurohormonal system. And they're treated also with aldosterone antagonists because we now recognize that all the ACE inhibitors in the world, all the ARBs, the angiotensin receptor blockers, or the two drugs given together do not fully suppress another adverse player in this milieu of heart failure, excess aldosterone activation, producing inflammatory lesions in the brain, in the vessels, causing fibrosis and scarring in the heart, increasing the risk of a arrhythmic sudden death, increasing the process of remodeling this fibrosis and the progressive thickness and dilation of these injured ventricles. And so now, we have two good trials. This one was done with a non-patented drug, spironolactone, an old drug. The patients who got spironolactone, compared to the patients here on ACE inhibitors now, plus diuretics, often with digoxin, were 30% less likely to die. So we combine, watching the potassium very carefully, the risk of the potassium going too high, an ACE inhibitor with an aldosterone antagonist. A new drug, a very similar drug, another aldosterone antagonist, is called eplerinone. And this is less sick patients post-MI. And the placebo group here is beta blockers. We're going to come to those. And ACE inhibitors. And the active group in, in, in green here is the eplerinone plus ACE inhibitor plus beta blocker. So many patients with heart failure question, why do I have to take all these drugs? And they have to take these drugs because we have very convincing trials to say that if they are lucky enough to be able to tolerate and take these drugs, they're going to have a profound impact on their survival. The biggest breakthrough drug has been completely conceptually difficult to appreciate. You would think if you had heart failure that the sympathetic nervous system, the system that tells your heart to beat harder and beat stronger so you can escape from a saber-toothed tiger or battle your neighbor um, for rights in the cave, you would think this system would be exactly what you need to tell this failing heart to do a better job. And for years, that was what we all thought. And we researched on drugs that stimulated and mimicked the sympathetic nervous system. We still use them sometimes if you've had open heart surgery or you're in such trouble with heart failure that you do indeed need extra stimulation through this sympathetic nervous system pathway to the heart, increasing contractility, increasing heart rate. But chronic congestive heart failure patients are seeing far too much adrenaline day and night. The heart remodels, it becomes, um, it becomes actually paradoxically weaker weaker. And we know this again because of basic work, and a lot of it was done at Stanford largely by my predecessors, but looking at the implanted hearts. And all these three trials here, a CBIS-2 trial is the name of the trial, the drug, the beta-1 blocker was called bisoprolol, U.S. carbedilol trials, just 1,092 patients. But the ejection fraction in that trial went from 19 to, 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 19 to 28% there was a 10-point ejection fraction approval when you took away the adrenaline. Double-blind trial, nobody knew who was getting carvedilol, nobody knew who was getting placebo. And a 64% survival benefit. And the trial, all these trials stopped early by independent data safety monitoring boards um, because it was felt to be unethical to continue the placebo patients without the benefits of the active therapy with the beta-blocking drug. Now again, some details, some skills as to who will tolerate these patients, how to gently uptitrate them, 
and many patients with stage D heart failure have had these drugs peeled away because they could no longer tolerate the high doses of antiadrenergic therapy that would otherwise be protective. One trial only with this non-selective vasodilating beta blocking drug has actually showed even patients with very advanced heart failure. Look at the mortality again here at one year. As you can see, 20% of the patients have died. And these patients here are on ACE inhibitors, and they're on taking diuretics and some on digoxin, and this substantial, again, 34% survival benefit. And you can see the difference in the curves, a practical benefit. All the effective drugs so far not only improve survival, they tend to make the patients feel better in double-blind trials, and they keep them out of hospital. However, there's an Achilles heel for many of our patients. And the Achilles heel remains the risk of arrhythmic sudden death. Of course, sudden death, death overall, is much more common in these so-called class four patients, the patients with severe heart failure. But in fact, sudden death as a problem, as a proportion of deaths, although the mortality overall is better, the proportion of patients who die suddenly is actually a bigger problem in the less symptomatic, less limited NYHA functional class two and three patients. But again, without going into a lot of data, we now can treat patients through a simple or relatively simple procedure and put under the skin in selected patients whose heart remains abnormally remodeled. We now know due to coronary artery disease or just to cardiomyopathy, and we can see a survival benefit by preventing that arrhythmic sudden death by having a specialized type of pacemaker that will monitor every heartbeat and deliver therapy, deliver a shock under appropriate circumstances so that patient doesn't have to rely on being witnessed and have bystanders do CPR and wait for the paramedics to save his life. Even more so than that, some patients who develop cardiomyopathy and heart failure have an abnormal abnormality in the electrical conduction of the heart. The wiring system, if you like, goes wrong. So seven, instead of the contraction being nicely coordinated with the electricity, signaling the heart to contract in an organized manner, almost like wringing out a towel and throwing the blood out into the aorta, the heart becomes dissynchronous. And it's been dis recognized now this has adverse consequences. Some are written on the slide. And that appropriate pacemakers, placing a lead in a vein, if you're lucky enough, you can get there, and placing a lead in the coronary sinus to pace simultaneously over the left and right ventricles to so-called resynchronize a patient. And again, two large randomized trials, I just show one of them here, survival benefit. And these three curves in this slide show the placebo patient on optimal medical therapy with a one-year event rate, um, a one-year um, event rate on optimal medical therapy of 19%. Um, and then the reduction, risk reduction shown with the so-called resynchronization therapy and the curves you can see clearly separate in terms of the patient who gets resynchronized and even further if that resynchronization device is combined with the capacity to deliver liver shock and, de and, uh, and defibrate you. So yesterday it was rather nice. I met one of these patients who I followed through who came to stand for a heart transplant and I saw him again in clinic and he's just been around at the right time. Now, without being able to, uh, this is a very dilated, very poor ventricle. This man has not had a heart attack. This is in June 1999. He had very high triglycerides. He had triglycerides at 2,000, which is very high. He has very high cholesterol, but didn't have coronary artery disease. He probably had a cardiomyopathy related to prior hypertension and insulin resistance. So very weak heart muscle. He was on all the right therapy, meaning he was lucky enough to be given um, beta-blocking drugs, ACE inhibitors, all the serial antagonists. But as you can see, he didn't really get better. We recognized he had a very large heart, and so he put a defibrillator in him, and the defibrillator, in fact, started firing, and quite clearly from interrogating the information of the device, um, was firing in such a way that he would have probably died without this defibrillator delivering shock therapy. But we recognized... And about that time, the resynchronization therapy with his extra pacing lead in the coronary sinus had been developed. And so he was treated with the resynchronization device. He's now lucky enough to be just on his, on his uh, beta-blocking drug, his aldosterone antagonist, and his ACE inhibitor. The only three drugs he takes, apart from his cholesterol medications, a lifestyle change, man who's changed his diet, normal lipid profile now, 
and this ejection fraction is normal, and this is asymptomatic. So this is what's taken place in the last 25 years. A lucky group of individuals can respond dramatically, and the challenge, and I think you is going to address this challenge, is to try and sort out who gets better and who doesn't and why, and can we genetically profile those patients and tailor therapy as opposed to treating populations? And most importantly, if you reach stage D heart failure, is there anything better that we can offer than cardiac transplantation, which offers the hope of a 60% survival, but is clearly a huge operation to go through, and clearly from a practical point of view, 2,000 procedures in the United States with 400,000 people dying from heart failure. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much indeed for attention. My task is to talk uh, not so much about where we've come from, but the future, and as you can see from my first slide, the future is coming. Michael already touched on this story, which is William Withering back in the 1970s uh, was publishing observations on digitalis. The main mechanism of action at that time was thought to be diuretic, and as, as, as he noted, uh, these treatments hadn't changed until really about 20 years ago. Uh, but the alternatives, as you can see noted at the end of the paragraph here, as well as the herbal diuretics, fluid restriction, these were combined with starvation, laxatives, and venesection. So hopefully those of us uh, who treat the heart failure patients and those patients with heart failure will be happy to be existing in this century rather than the 1700s. Uh, Michael was also fairly uh, humble about his own achievements in this area, and you can see uh, further down in the middle of this slide, his name uh, prominently featured, and he really was one of the people who, who established the use of beta blockers uh, for the treatment of heart failure, and with these very uh, significant percentage reductions in mortality. Many other things were defined at Stanford, and I won't go, th go through them all, but as a new faculty member here within the heart failure group, it's somewhat daunting to see from where we've come, um, and my challenge is to try and think about where we might be going. So one of the opportunities uh, that uh, brought itself to the fore that uh, gave us some idea of where we might be going was, was put together in 2001 when the Human Genome Project was finally published and Eric Lander and Craig Venter, who are shown here on the left, presented the provisional uh, Human Genome Project, the three billion base pairs, the signature uh, of life, really the alphabet that makes up our genetic code. And it was felt that this was going to usher in a whole new era of therapies and a whole new era of understanding of basic biology. And certainly we're trying to apply some of the insights from that within the treatment of heart failure. And I'm going to talk about two specific applications of that uh, data today, uh, discoveries of new therapies. And I'll talk about some experiments that we've been doing at Stanford aimed at finding new therapies for heart failure. And then better applications of the existing therapies Michael talked about how for a small subset of patients there are very dramatic responses out there. Well, th we'd like to make that subset bigger. We'd, we'd like to find out why those patients uh, respond and other patients don't and then find treatments for all the patients. So here's the outline to the 20 minutes or so I'll talk. We'll introduce a few aspects of, of molecular, uh, discovering new agents and some of the new experiments we've been doing at Stanford and finally talk about personalized medicine. So here's molecular. I like to think about uh, the cell in very simple terms. I have a very simple brain, so I like to do it that way. And I think of uh, molecular biology a bit like baking a cake. Uh, as you can see from uh, the Betty Crocker cookbook for boys and girls in the top left, we can think of DNA as the recipe book uh, for life. It's c the, the DNA is present in every single cell in our body, so it's in the, in the blood cells that circulate, and we can get an insight into it from a blood test, but it's in every single other cell and it's wound up in this tight double helix. And we'll talk a little bit more about the structure in a moment. The RNA is actually what we transcribe. So if you can imagine the, the old cookbook from the past is written down, as you can see uh, just to the left there, um, is written down in the other book. And so the message, the message from the first cookbook is copied down. This is the, the, the job of the RNA. And it then takes the building blocks, which here are the amino acids, uh, but we're thinking here in terms of making the cake about these being the ingredients and one of them, flour, is shown here. And finally, it's the proteins that actually do the work of the cell. And the proteins are like the finished product and the uh, rather tasty looking uh, bun here at the bottom. So what is DNA? And there's some, some more famous people uh, at the top right of this slide, uh, Francis Crick and James Watson, along with Rosalind Franklin, who were the ones responsible for finding the structure shown here underneath of deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's, it's such that there are, are four of these base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, that bind together, but in a very specific way. 
So the, the G and the C link together using a special bond called a hydrogen bond, and the A and the T link together. And this structure uh, with, with the sugar phosphate backbone was what won the, uh, in fact, not Rosalind Frank Franklin, but uh, Morris Wilkins and the two gentlemen the Nobel Prize in the 1950s. Um, so the, the unique binary structure, this signature where G always sticks to C and A always sticks to C, actually suggests and allows us to have molecular biology tools, some quite clever things where we can find out, first of all, what the sequence is, so we can find out what the code is, but also do one or two other fairly specialized things with it. And a gentleman from the University of Oxford called Edwin Southern was one of the first people to notice that we could hybridize, in other words, have a piece of DNA stick to another piece, not in the body, but actually in a test tube. And he, he gave his name to a, a method called the Southern blot. And then the, the rather humorous uh, molecular biologists who uh, make up jokes, I guess, in the labs when uh, time, is, time is long and experiments are long, uh, decided to, to label the follow-ups to those northerns and westerns. Uh, which are different kinds of blots and sticking different pieces of, in, nor in the case of a northern western, a northern um, RNA together, and the case of a western where an antibody sticks to a protein. And then, of course, there's a polymerase chain reaction, a, a long term that is just means we find a way of mimicking what happens in the body where we can actually uh, amplify DNA. And this opened a whole, these tools opened a whole new world uh, of uh, molecular biology. So a, a, a quick quiz here. Maybe many of you are, uh, know the answers to this, but sometimes the answers are surprising. Um, I'll let you mentally note to yourself what the answer to this might be. The initial estimates for how many genes were in the human genome were somewhere around here, 100,000. And we felt for a, an organism as complicated as ours, it may even be more. And then as the human genome went on and the computer algorithms for guessing where the genes were, we kept downgrading the number of genes. And uh, first of all, it was 56, and then someone else guessed around 70, and then around 40. And then at the, the time the human genome was published, we thought it was around 35. Well, the, the new estimates suggest it's actually closer to 20,000, maybe around 23,000 at the most. So we actually have very few genes. Each gene codes for, uh, codes for one protein. And then what about our genetic heritage? I think we all can see similar. Sometimes I look in the mirror and see similarities uh, with this gentleman here, a chimpanzee. Maybe not too surprising that we share 99% of our genes with a chimpanzee. Still perhaps incredible that we, we think of ourselves as very different from chimpanzees, or at least I like to, um, but we share a large percentage of our genes. Well, what about a fish? We don't, we don't think of ourselves, I generally don't think of myself as too similar to this beast. Um, but remarkably, we share probably about 50% of our genes with fish. And then only on, the, only on my best days do I share any characteristics of the daffodil. Um, but this might surprise you, 35% of our genes are shared with the lowly daffodil. So our genetic heritage is long and complicated, and we're in the middle of trying to work it out. So how does, what does all this mean for, for heart failure? And that's what we've spent some time trying to do at Stanford. What about tomorrow's targets? We've talked about the ACE inhibitors and the beta blockers and the aldosterone antagonists. Wh where are we going to find treatments for tomorrow? I'm not going to go in detail through this tale, but it hit the news last week, and I thought it, it was an important uh, illustration of, of where things can go wrong. Uh, this is a treatment for high cholesterol that Pfizer, which is the world's largest uh, pharmaceutical company, have had. It's been worth $12 billion in annual sales. And with the patent running out in, in a few years' time, they've been looking hard to develop an alternative. Looking hard and spending a lot of money, $800 million is approximately, it's at the upper end, but it's approximately what it costs to bring a new drug to market. And the trials uh, were in combination with their present drug, Lipitor or Torvastatin. And the analysts who were looking at this before the American Heart meeting of last year projected the annual sales for the new drug to be around $15 billion. But unfortunately, at the beginning of December, all of a sudden, it came out very fast. It was noted that in the trial that was happening, the deaths were 60% higher with the combination. That's not a good... Uh, that's not a good new drug if the deaths are increased by 60%. That's about as bad as it could be. So the FDA were informed. And as you can see, this, the share price of Pfizer dived overnight, wiping approximately $21 billion off the market value of Pfizer. And as many of you might have heard in the news, Pfizer then announced a whole restructuring with a 10% loss of workforce. So really, the money was going up in flames. The question is, is there a better way of doing this 
is there a more targeted way that we can use this genetic information to, to, to go in a, in a much more uh, honed manner, a much more targeted way to try and avoid spending $8 million, $800 uh, million before finding out that there was not a better way. So this has been our approach uh, at Stanford over the last few years to try and find a new treatment for heart failure. We start with the disease. We use some of the unique tools that I began to describe earlier, high throughput tools of modern molecular biology, to find new candidates that we think will be good targets. And from there, we do molecular dissection and physiology experiments in models in the lab. We work hard to see if we can show effects in the lab. And finally, we never lose sight of the fact that all our science is aimed towards a new diagnostic or a therapeutic. And so this is our approach. Sometimes, of course, this last arrow is important. And we may come to here and do the trial and find that we actually have to go back to the lab and rethink. So here's a microarray. This is uh, one of the tools actually invented at, at Stanford by Pat Brown in his lab. And it's a way of, of looking at multiple genes, the gene expression. We can, in fact, look at the gene expression of all the genes in the human genome on one slide, approximately the size of my thumb. And that's how large the slide is. I've blown it up for you here. There's actually a magnification here to show you. Each one of these dots represents the gene expression of a single gene. And if we can take a piece of tissue or even a, um, a heart blood cell, we can actually then get these 25,000 data points for the gene expression of every single gene in the genome. And so this technology was available, and we felt that we had a very unique resource here at Stanford. And in fact, again, the, uh, the uh, credit for this goes entirely to, to Dr. Fowler, because uh, what he thought at the time was that we, we, at Stanford, we were also one of the first to put in these left ventricular assist devices. So a heart, kind of artificial heart that helps these very weakened hearts to recover a little bit while we wait for a transplant donor to become available. And what he did was, obviously, as you can see, when this device is put in, there's going to be a little bit of heart tissue taken out. Well, he collected the heart tissue and then waited while that patient uh, waited for transplant, and then any time between two months and 12 months later, the patient had a heart transplant, at which point the whole of the heart came out. So we now have two samples from the same patient, one at the very weakest point, and one two to 12 months later when the patient has actually had some recovery of heart muscle function because it's been offloaded by this artificial heart. So what we did was combine this very unique idea with the microarray that you saw on the previous slide to look at the gene expression changes, because we thought if we can see what genes are changing when the heart's recovering, we might have a clue as to where we might find our next therapy in heart failure. And so that's what we did. So you might recognize the gentleman on the left. Most people, I think of him as a, I guess, now retired politician. I, I think of him more of a, as a philosopher of science, because he, he, said something, he said something really very intelligent one day. He said this. He said, reports that say something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because, as we know, there are known knowns. Things we know, we know. That seems reasonable. He said, we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. <laughs> that also seems quite reasonable to me. But then finally, he, he said, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> and although I think he was talking about the whereabouts or not of, of Osama bin Laden, I thought he actually said something very profound here. He actually got a foot and mouth award from the Plain English Speaking Society for, for saying this. <laughs> but I, I think he said something profound, specifically about microarrays, actually. This is what he was talking about. Because in a microarray, you see there are known knowns. There are genes we know, and we have the name, and we know what they do, and we know what they're for. And then there are known unknowns. There are genes who ha which have a name, but they have no function. And then in decreasingly now, but at the time we did this study, there were a few of the unknown unknowns, genes about which we knew nothing. They had no name, they had no function. And so this is what we were looking at when we set out with this experiment, and here's the principal result. And don't worry about the colors or really the list. This is the most upregulated 100 genes. Actually, I think there's only maybe 50 on this slide. And the most uh, importantly, downregulated 10 or 15 genes. Now, one of the first things was that we find an important diagnostic gene here, this natriuretic peptide gene. And uh, Michael mentioned, mentioned it earlier. And this had already been shown to be an important diagnostic in heart failure. So it gave us some sense that this could be an important technique and we could find something new. And right up at the top was a gene called angiotensin receptor-like 1. 
Well, that sounded familiar to us, angiotensin. That sounds like it might be important in heart failure, but receptor-like one, so it's like angiotensin, but not the same. So we were intrigued, and we really, to cut a long story short, because you don't, I think, want to hear the whole story, spent the next four years looking into this system. At the time that we discovered it, there was very, really very little known, almost nothing known about it, other than the ligand for the receptor could reduce blood pressure. But summarized on this slide is, is four years of, of work, essentially. Uh, first of all, we worked out where it was, which is in the blood vessels. Also, the receptors found on the heart. We then injected it into mice and did a magnetic resonance imaging scan and showed that the heart function really didn't change a great deal, um, but that we seemed to reduce load because the, the, the size of the heart just before it contracts was, low, was lower when we gave the aplin. Um, we also did a, a study where we put a pressure catheter actually into, the, the, into a mouse heart to measure the effect of this new peptide, and we found that it improved the contraction. So it reduced the load, it improved the contraction, it seemed to do it in a safe way. This is a result from a single cell where we infused the peptide onto a single cell and showed an increase in the contraction. And finally, it seemed to have a, an important, uh, not shown here, an important uh, effect on fluid balance. So it seemed to be hitting three or four of our really our holy grail uh, features. If we were to, to lay out what would be the holy grail of a, of a new intervention for this, we seem to be, just by luck really, be hitting it or, or by sort of programmed luck. And so finally what we had to do was, was test do an animal model of heart failure and actually see if, if we could improve heart failure in an animal model. And just in the last few months we've been able to show that. And, so here in, in, a, in a rat model on the left-hand side, and here, maybe focus on the one on the right for, for a short time here. Um, this graph with the little open squares is what happens if you give no aplin. So we, heart failure is here. This is the ejection fraction, the amount of blood pushed out by the ventricle every beat. And as you can see, it goes down by about 20%. But if we give aplin to this group, it's actually completely abrogated. So it completely stops heart failure in this model. And so as a result of this, we're really very excited to move this as fast as possible uh, to human trials and to try and see if we can really have a, the same sort of significant effect in humans as we can have in the smaller animals. Uh, and we're, we're, I, I'm excited because I think this is a great example of the sort of collaborations that's, that we're able to do at Stanford using new technology and the unique resources from the cardiovascular medicine department. So here's the last part then. I promised a little bit about uh, personalized medicine. And we're going to shift a little bit. We were talking about gene expression there. So that's the, if you like, that's the copy book where we took the recipe and, and wrote it down in another book. We're looking at the message as it goes by. Well, sometimes there are variations like spelling errors, if you like, in the cookbook itself. And that's where the era of, era of personalized medicine comes in. I don't think you need the photograph on the right to uh, have me tell you that there are differences in, in the humans and uh, other animals with genetic variation. There's very common genetic variation. 90% of genetic variation is single nucleotides, so there are single spelling mistakes just where one, one letter is, is exchanged for another. And these occur with 1% with frequency every 100 to 300 bases. Remember, there's 3 billion letters in the human genome, so it's actually very, very common. And a sort of follow-up to the Human Genome Project was this uh, uh, SNP, SNP is how we usually call it, single nucleotide polymorphism, this variation database which was actually uh, more or less complete, although it's still being, being added to. And so we do also have a database, an encyclopedia of common human genetic variation. And here was a study not done by us in one of the receptors for, for beta blockers that showed uh, a ratio of five to one, so a risk ratio of, for the time to death or heart transplant within a heart failure population, depending on which one of these variants you had in your genome. So clearly the, it has a very important role to play and we have to describe it. Last week I was here at this forum talking about disease, one disease that's caused by very rare mutations, but mutations that have very large effects. And these are the diseases that run in families, and this is the most common cardiovascular one, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's, it's about one in 500 in the population. But the mutations are very rare, although there's 400 mutations. If you think 400 different mutations causing a 1 in 500 disease, it's much more than a 1% frequency, which is what we were talking about for the, uh, for the SNPs. So here's one example of uh, where uh, these changes in the code, changes in the recipe book, can actually have a significant effect. This is a, a nerve ending where the adrenaline equivalent norepinephrine is, is pushed out into this space here. And here are those receptors we were talking about. 
and this particular study, they looked at variations both in, in the way that uh, the amount of, of norepinephrine was pushed into the space and in the receptor, and they found that the two of them together made heart failure much more likely. So it was effectively a looking at the genome to find people who were susceptible to heart failure. And that is a whole new concept, which is we're really only just beginning to get our, our head around. What about picking out the, the people who've had the treatments that we know can work, uh, or, or treatments that may work better when we find a small subset? And this was an example of that from a, a trial of beta blockers, where they looked at a particular change in, in one of the beta receptors. Again, a, cha a, a single uh, base pair change in, in the coding for that receptor. And they found that whereas the, in the overall study, uh, not shown here, there was no real difference amongst the groups with this particular beta blocker, that if they pulled out just the people who had this genetic variation and left the others, that they had a very significant uh, improvement in, or in this case, a reduction in mortality. So this is a, an, a, an area where we're really calling pharmacogenomics. It's the combination of pharmacology and genomics. So looking at variations within the genome to try and find out who's going to benefit or who's going to benefit the most. So we're also attacking this question at Stanford, and just in the last couple of slides, I'm going to mention, that, mention this. In, in the past, those two slides I just showed were a, what we call a candidate gene approach. Somebody said, I think we'll, we'll look for variation in this receptor because it seems like that's where the money is. And we picked out a couple of variations and just looked at two of those. Well, again, Stanford-based uh, technology gives us the ability to really do this bottom thing, which is to test all of the genes. And the cost of genotyping a single gene, and that's the name given to just looking at those variants, has gone down such that in 1999 it cost a dollar to do one. But in October 2006, that had gone to three zeros five, which means that for about eight or nine hundred dollars, you can do all the variants, or at least a representative of all the variants in the human genome. So we're in, a, we're in a new world now. And so this is the study we're currently in the midst of doing at Stanford. We have, again, under Michael's leadership, set up a cardiomyopathy and heart failure tissue bank and database. So all the patients that come through Stanford are, are put into our database. We have all the clinical information. And then we have a blood sample from those who are willing to give it to us so that we have potentially access to the genetic information for all the patients we're treating. And over the time, this will give us a, a phenomenal resource for, for looking at the next generation treatment, for doing these pharmacogenomic studies. And the first one we're doing is, is already underway and due for completion really in the next couple of months where we're looking at 500,000 of these variations. So that's representing variation across the whole genome. And what we're doing is identifying the two extremes. We look at the people who had these really dramatic responses, such as the one that Michael showed at the end of his talk. And then we look at the people who sadly had no response, who didn't do well, who ended up with a heart transplant. And we're going to look at the genetic variation between those two groups and see if we can find, maybe it will be, maybe it will be gene variation within places we expect, maybe, like these beta receptors or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Maybe it'll be somewhere completely different. Perhaps it'll be in these insulin resistance pathways because we have some new ideas about where, where, what may be causing some of these conditions and by corollary, uh, what may be helping those conditions. So that's a little blast through uh, where we've come and, and where we're going. Um, and that's all I have to say for now. I will repeat the question. It was quite a long question. It referred to a, a book, a publication I'm not aware of that has raised concerns as to whether there is an interaction, which is a very important issue, between ACE inhibitors specifically and non steroidal anti-inflammatories. And then the questioner, I think, asked a very good question. Uh, but he did, I think, tend to go into one area where there's almost no controversy. On the whole, non steroidal anti -inflammatory, inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs, with the exception of aspirin, are going to have adverse cardiovascular effects that are most apparent in patients with heart failure. So when we meet a patient with heart failure, there's a lot of education, a lot of help perhaps in going through all the medications they're taking, a lot of advice about diet. And one of the things that we do is we make certain the patients who have heart failure who should be on an ACE inhibitor or an antitensor receptor blocker are not having the adverse effect from a non steroidal anti inflammatory. The non steroidal anti inflammatory, the impact of aspirin is much less clear. And a very controversial subject, looking back through the trials and trying to work out who was on aspirin and who wasn't, 
and was whether the undoubted benefit, the absolutely clearly established benefit of ACE inhibitors is somehow reduced or mitigated by aspirin remains controversial. My interpretation of the data is that there is an interaction. It is small enough to be unimportant and does not take away from the benefits of aspirin in general cardiovascular health in this patient population. So we routinely use ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers and have our patients when indicated on aspirin, but always avoid non steroidal anti-inflammatories, including when these patients develop a common complication of a patient on diuretics with their background conditions of gout. And so we use an old-fashioned drug for gout, often colchicine, or even have patients take steroids because we see patients run into trouble, to end up in hospital, get renal dysfunction when they're treated with non -steroidals. So you brought an important question up, but you surprised me in one area. You questioned as to whether ACE inhibitors are any good or not. And the nice thing about heart failure, we have such poor prognosis and such bad outcomes, and we can, mod we can also use as a surrogate this improvement in the remodeling process, that every one of the trials, drugs that are used routinely in heart failure has been shown in patient populations that the patients who receive these drugs benefit substantially. The individual patient is the next holy grail that I think my colleague Ewan explained so nicely in his presentation. Do we have similar techniques to look at the proteins? Thinking about the proteins, which is the end of the, the arrow when I was thinking about the DNA to RNA to, to protein, um, are there studies that have shown that those proteins are, are associated with disease? One of the big challenges with the proteins is that they have a three-dimensional structure. I think you alluded to it in your, in your question. One of the nice things about DNA is that it really doesn't. So we have the ability to, uh, to, to, to look at these base pairs and actually look at the signature in a way that's really much harder with proteins. And the probably, uh, where, whereas we're thinking 25,000 approximately genes on the microarray for gene expression, we probably would have to multiply that number by 10 or 100 to start to think about the different protein conformations. Having said that, we, we're working on that problem as well, and we do have microarrays at Stanford that are protein arrays, and we're, we're applying those also to this population, in fact, to the insulin resistance population to try and find markers so that we could find a blood test, for example, of someone with insulin resistance or somebody who might go on to develop heart failure that we might be able to intervene at this stage A stage, you know, the, where they're at risk potentially or, or have risk factors for heart failure. It's a question that's asking whether um, there's, a, there's a member of the audience who's noticing that many of his friends, and he refers to it being a disease of his age, and um, perhaps he's slightly over 50, and suggesting um, that this is a disease that's going to occur amongst his friends and his colleagues. Unfortunately, in this country at the moment, we're now seeing diabetes amongst high school children. And it, we used to refer to diabetes as adult onset diabetes and juvenile onset diabetes being this different disease where the pancreatic beta cells couldn't make insulin and required insulin injections anymore. We have to change our terminology. The sedentary lifestyle, the genetic predisposition, which is it, it, all of us to some extent, and um, the tendency to be heavier than we used to be in the past and eating more foods has definitely led to a true epidemic of diabetes. And there's an extraordinarily well-established link between diabetes and cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death. Unfortunately, many patients, when they get diabetes, are appropriately worried about going blind, appropriately worried about losing a limb or renal failure. But the majority of patients with diabetics should be regarded for the same risks of a heart attack as a man who's already had a heart attack without diabetes. The prognosis after the heart attacks is worse. The risk of getting heart failure is higher. And these two conditions are linked at every level and a huge amount of being, work being done at Stanford. Having said that, we do have much better drugs than we used to have to control diabetes, to control blood pressure in diabetes, to control cholesterol and lipid levels in diabetes, and we can do a great deal more than we used to be able to do to manage that risk. The preceding program was brought to you by Stanford on iTunes U.
and is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at itunes.stanford.edu.